Russian forces have now raised over $4 million through anonymous cryptocurrency donations since the start of the war in an effort to circumvent international sanctions against them. In this video, I'll break down how cryptocurrency is changing the way Russian and Ukrainian forces raise money, how the US government is trying to control it, and whether or not your crypto bro cousin was actually right about all of this. Russian paramilitary groups like Task Force Rusich, which has ties to the brutal Wagner mercenary group, raised $400,000 in cryptocurrency since the start of the invasion, and they did this simply by promoting themselves on Twitter and Telegram channels in public. Unlike traditional banking transactions, the US government is unable to freeze or confiscate this cryptocurrency. This might not sound like a lot of money, but with one ruble now valued at less than two American cents, that money buys you an awful lot in Russia. For example, Russian soldiers were able to construct advanced UAVs for only $3,400 and buy 15 tactical radios for only 650 bucks. That's a tiny fraction of what it would cost in the United States. And now it's a huge upgrade to that unit's reconnaissance capabilities. TRM Labs and Chain Analysis investigate crypto financial crimes. They uncovered 54 different pro-Russian groups raising cryptocurrencies for war, including Mu Veshe, which is not the name of a cow unless your cow is a neo-Nazi. They've received 103 deposits in Bitcoin and Ethereum, totaling $56,000. Russian troops even posted photos verifying their purchases made with cryptocurrencies, including thermal imagers, binoculars, rangefinders, spotting scopes. It gets much worse, that's just the tip of the iceberg. According to a February 14th report, Moscow used their fast-growing ransomware industry in 2021 to steal $400 million worth of cryptocurrency. This money went directly to groups that are affiliated with the Russian government and could easily be funneled to their military. Digital currencies like Bitcoin were originally invented in 2009 to allow you to make financial transactions without needing to rely on old school centralized banks or governments. Since its creation, Bitcoin has exploded to being used by over 1 billion people today, accounting for nearly $1.3 trillion in total money in the world, which until recently could be sent anonymously and without government regulation. For instance, the total amount of traditional assets frozen in bank accounts by Western sanctions already amount to a staggering $1 trillion. Analysts estimate these sanctions cost Putin $50 billion per year. The United States' ability to freeze assets is one of their greatest soft power projection tools. Muveche and Task Force Rusic are already sanctioned by the US Treasury Office of Foreign Asset Control. The OFAC has its roots in the Treasury Department, handling sanctions since prior to the War of 1812. It was formally created in December of 1950 after China entered the Korean War and President Truman used it to block all Chinese and North Korean assets that were under US jurisdiction. To give you an idea of just how powerful it is, right after the Taliban retook Afghanistan in 2021, after the US withdrawal, the United States OFAC responded by freezing Afghanistan's entire central reserve of $9.5 billion and set it aside in a trust fund in a Swiss bank. They're basically like the Britney Spears conservatorship for Afghanistan's money. Cryptocurrency operates outside this system and could circumvent the United States' powerful asset freezing tool. This is part of what's being tested right now with Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, if only someone could just explain to me what a blockchain is. Romanov Lite is another channel created in April 2020 that's brought in $170,000 in cryptocurrencies since the beginning of the invasion, specifically for their Special Rapid Response Unit, a Russian Special Forces group. Russian arms manufacturer Lobev, based in Kaluga Oblast, tried to circumvent the sanctions by soliciting donations for their long-range precision sniper rifles on crypto platforms. It's like a crowdfunding Kickstarter page for war that also never follows through on their campaign promises. Putin, you said for 20 crypto dollars you'd capture Kiev by March. For evidence of this, we need look no further than Russia's deputy finance minister, Oleski Moisev, who said in October that Moscow has been working on creating a digital ruble for the first time ever in 2023. He said, quote, if we launch this, then other countries will begin to actively use it going forward, and America's control over the global financial system will effectively end. So now you can see why cryptocurrency could be such a huge threat to NATO. It has the potential to disrupt one of NATO's greatest weapons, economic sanctions. But wait, we can trace all of this money, right? All of these Bitcoin transactions, so why can't we freeze it? 
They can't always be blocked because especially when they're located in places like Russia or the Huabi crypto exchange in China, which has been happily funneling money to the Russian war machine, they're outside the dang matrix. For this reason, crypto theft has been used by the North Korean government and their hackers to steal about $1 billion in cryptocurrency between January 2017 and November 2020. It could get complicated though, because sometimes it's the side that you're rooting for benefiting from these crypto technologies. Just days after the invasion, the Ukrainian official Twitter account announced that they would be accepting any and all donations through Bitcoin and Ethereum, which allowed for the rapid support by individuals across the globe. And by May of 2022, over 184 million in crypto dollars was raised by the Ukrainian government far outpacing Russia's 4 million. They even received this NFT as a donation valued at over $200,000. Yes, this handful of pixels here was enough to fund an entire Javelin and a handful of AT4s while you're at it. War, war always changes. Ukraine Vice Prime Minister Fedorov shared on Twitter, while Russia uses tanks to destroy Ukraine, we rely on revolutionary blockchain tech. So this shows how cryptocurrency can clearly be a force for good and allow regular people around the world to donate to help fight back against Putin violating international law. We're seeing the international community trying to grapple with the consequences of that in real time. But what if the money you're personally donating gets used in ways that you don't agree with? A deeper look at the crypto funds released by the Ukrainian Ministry of Digital Transformation. Part of this breakdown involved over $5 million worth of lethal weapons requested by the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. This has caused some backlash among crypto activists who didn't want to see crypto technology being used for these purposes of inflicting casualties. Kuna Crypto Exchange founder Michael Chobin actually originally claimed that the initial fundraising effort that the crypto money sent to Ukraine would be used for non-lethal aid only. Many people thought that they were donating towards humanitarian aid and would never have given money if they knew that their crypto funds were going towards weapons and their obvious consequences on the battlefield. Some online fundraising sites like Patreon have since removed certain Ukraine fundraising organizations from the site for this exact reason. The fact remains, avoiding traditional markets has some benefits in wartime because the transfer of funds is almost instantaneous, taking only 10 to 30 minutes instead of the three days long wait that you have to do with your international regular bank. Not a big deal when you're cashing grandma's birthday check, but in war, it could be the difference between you conducting operations with the gear and weapons you need or not having anything at all. All of this criticism matters because it's where you'll start to see and hear the justifications for why cryptocurrencies need to be regulated by the world's governments. Governments want to have more control over Bitcoin because Bitcoin presents three challenges to government authority. First, it cannot be regulated by them. Second, it's used by criminals. And third, it can help citizens circumvent government controls. So almost immediately beginning with the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, digital money came under intense, heavy scrutiny by the world's governments. Evidence of this comes from the US government's Office of Foreign Asset Control, cracking down on crypto mixer groups like Tornado Cash, which has funneled money to Russian forces. But they're also hitting two birds with one stone because it has the side effect of giving them more control over money in the world. A few days after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we saw President Biden sign an executive order on ensuring responsible development of digital assets on March 9, 2022. The third objective listed, 2C, is to quote, mitigate the illicit finance and national security risk posed by misuse of digital assets. The invasion clearly accelerated the US government's attention on controlling the crypto market. Right after the invasion of Ukraine, American officials quickly asked the major crypto exchanges like Binance Holdings to use a targeted approach focused only on Russian assets that have been sanctioned, and so far they're complying. Binance instantly froze the crypto wallets belonging to that Russian arms manufacturer Lobov that we mentioned earlier. By March 6th of this year, just a few days after the announcement by the Treasury Department, the popular crypto company Coinbase had already blocked well over 25,000 different IP addresses that were tied to actions seeking to evade the sanctions. It turns out cryptocurrency can be regulated and controlled by governments. War, war always changes. There's a strong case to be made that the Russian-Ukrainian war may have been the arrow in Bitcoin's heart to some degree. 
Bitcoin has plunged from a $2 trillion market cap to under $800 billion since the start of the invasion. And analysts believe this plunge is in large part because of the increased government oversight that the war brought on. The United States government has since discredited one of Bitcoin's central promises, that these alternative currencies are immune to government oversight and regulation, and that they offer total anonymity. 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 But all this really means is that crypto's real threat to Western national security comes from its full adoption by adversarial countries. The CCP just deployed a test of their first digital currency app this year that allows their population to create an e-wallet and use a digital version of their money. And then you see this sign, it means electronic Chinese yuan, I think. Uh, that means that you can use your digital currencies to pay for your stuff. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are banned in China because the CCP can't control it. This new Chinese government coin allows Xi Jinping to fully control the money through their central banking system. The United States government is far behind China in this regard. They're currently only in the research phase of creating what they call the US central bank digital currency. Uh, that we are committed to carefully and thoughtfully evaluating the potential costs and benefits of a central bank digital currency for the US economy and payment system. We have not made a decision to issue it, a, a CBDC. We might be staring at the beginning of a crypto arms race without even knowing it. Historically, during armed conflict, countries that have always really relied on taxing their population, getting foreign aid donated, or through some form of war bond if it got really bad. This is the first time we're seeing individual people donating money directly to another country's government, which in turn is used to buy weapons of war. And now we have meme coins and NFTs funding Javelin missile launchers. Some people view it as a way of democratizing and decentralizing banks, while others see it as a dangerous, unregulated, and perfect vehicle to avoid laws and sanctions. In the war in Ukraine, we see a bit of both. War always changes in the way you least expect. Hey, Spare Parts Army, I need to make some retractions. In the last video, I made it sound like Ukraine was escalating the war by attacking deep within Russian territory. What I meant to say was that the whole war is escalating, and I was trying to track that escalation from Russia's invasion to today. But I could see where I really confused people there. Also, I'm one of the channels that makes predictions in this war, and I often get them very, very wrong. But I show you my work, and I hope that you can learn from my mistakes. But I've heard you guys in the comments section, and in 2023, I'm gonna do a better job. Remember to follow me on Instagram, at CappyArmy, for a weekly updated link to the script for this video that has links to all of my research process.